Colby. So let me give him a proper introduction, and then we'll welcome our friend Colby. So uh, for 20 years, Colby has been a pastor. Uh, the first decade within evangelical Christianity and this last decade is a post-evangelical uh, progressive Christian. He's the author of two books, Unclobber, Rethinking Our Misuse of the Bible on Homosexuality, and The Shift, A Survival Guide for Becoming a Progressive Christian, for which he's currently on a nationwide tour, sharing with communities about a vision for a kind of Christian practice, but with a progressive flavor. He planted a progressive Christian church in San Diego in 2014 called Sojourn Grace Collective. He enjoys golfing, running, and yoga, and uh, we're so glad to have Colby Martin. So let's put our hands together and give a warm well, uh, well welcome for Colby. Ah, so good. All right. There's this old Jewish story years and years and years and years ago about two brothers named Jacob and Esau. Remember this story? Okay, so these brothers had a bit of a contentious relationship from the get-go. Jacob was known to be a bit of a conniving, mischievous manipulator, and a couple times in his relationship with his brother Esau, he did a bit of swindling and maneuvering and caused a situation for himself in which he had to flee his home in order to escape this murderous rage from his brother Esau. And so in Genesis 32, if you read the story there, what you discover is these brothers have been estranged for like 20 years. 20 years of Jacob wondering, have I forever forfeit my ability to have a relationship with my brother for what I've done? And maybe Esau wondering, if I ever see that guy again, <laughs> watch out. And so we get to Genesis 32, and there's this moment in Jacob's life where he's amassed for himself a, a significant amount of wealth, uh, a couple wives, hashtag biblical marriage. <laughs> and he thinks to himself, I think I'm ready to try and reconcile with my brother Esau. And so he packs up all of his things and he makes this trek across the land to return to his brother. But he thinks to himself along the way, I don't know how this is going to go. Because last time I saw Esau, I swindled him out of his inheritance and his blessing. And so he comes up with this plan as a way to kind of pacify. This is what the story says, to pacify Esau. And his plan is this. It's not a bad plan. And as I'll say in a minute, I kind of understand it. And so what Jacob does is he divvies up his group into about three different segments of goats and bulls and sheep and cows. And, and he's, he sends them on ahead to his brother Esau. Because what he discovered when he started to get towards his brother's camp is he discovered that Esau was also coming out to meet him. But the storyteller says Esau came with 400 men. Now... I don't need to tell you that coming out with 400 men is probably not a welcome party as much as it is a, what do you want? <laughs> like, if you're here, you're going to have to fight. So Jacob sends out these series of three uh, traveling, you might call it the, the first edible arrangement as he sends ahead <laughs> these bulls and goats as sort of an offering to try and pacify his brother. And with each successive group, uh, they're told to say, yeah, Jacob, he's right behind us. He'll be here in just a minute. But then instead of Jacob, another round of gifts come. And all of this effort by Jacob to try and sort of appease or soothe or, you know, bring down any sort of hostility or aggression that might be still residing within Esau over the last 20 years. And the storyteller says that on the final night before Jacob was set to be reunited with his estranged brother, Jacob took his family across the Jabbok River, settled in there, and then he came back by himself, and he spent the night alone. Now, if you've ever had a significant moment of transformation in your life, if you've ever had a significant moment where you realize you're at sort of this fork in the road, as though there's this moment where you can choose to continue on the path that you're on, or, hmm... Oftentimes what I've found is those moments, they come when you're all alone. When you're stripped of everything that has provided you security and stability. Whether that's family, whether that's community, whether that's possessions. I've often found that those moments when we have to encounter 
the deepest depths of who we are and we're invited to transformation, those come when we, we got nothing left. And so this night, Jacob's alone on, the, on his side of the Jabbok River and the storyteller says that a man began to wrestle with him. <laughs> what a fun way to start the story. Where'd this man come from? Don't know. Who is he? Don't care. He began to wrestle a man. And all night they wrestled. The implication being, like, it was a pretty even fight. It was a fight amongst equals. And all night they wrestled. Until the sun began to crest upon the, the hills and the man, the mysterious late night visitor says, let me go for it is daybreak. And Jacob says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. <laughs> what a strange thing to say. <laughs> let me go. I won't let you go unless you bless me. If you ever find yourself into like a street fight or like a bar fight this afternoon, <laughs> and the person's like, just let me go. And you're like, I won't let you go unless you bless me. Just try that out. See how it goes. I'm really curious. And so the late night visitor, I won't let you go unless you bless me. The late night visitor says, what's your name? <laughs> Great response. Uh, what's your name? And Jacob says, I'm Jacob. And he says, what's your name? <laughs> and he doesn't tell him, which I love that part. We'll get to that in a minute. But he says, no, your name's not Jacob anymore. Not anymore. Now your name is Israel. Huh. That's interesting. All alone, the eve before seeing his brother whom he hasn't seen in 20 years, essentially stripped of everything that he's got for the, for the, for the moment, fighting this, this battle, this struggle. And now this stranger essentially says, you ain't Jacob no more, you're Israel. And that's the end of the story. <laughs> hey, good morning, Arizona. <laughs> How you doing? Yeah, it's really good to be here. Um, as Ryan mentioned, by the way, thank you for that lovely overly kind welcome. Um, I really like being with, with y'all. Like I've been, uh, I've been with The Well uh, before, um, and I know some of you in this room have been with you in even previous iterations of different faith communities, some even hearkening back to when I worked in the valley 15 years ago. And uh, every time I come to a space like this, I'm reminded of <sighs> our best days are still in front of us, y'all. Like, we're, we, we were talking last night about how progress is just always two steps forward, one step back. And I sometimes feel like those, and this is, by the way, this has nothing to do with my notes. This is a free little mini sermon. I sometimes feel like the, uh, the, those of us who might gravitate towards the left, I'll just say progressive. Look, I identify as a progressive. If that's not you, that's fine. But that's kind of what my work is about. Those who want to stay Christian in some ways, but have it be a more progressive bent. Sometimes I find like, over here on the left, we can hyper-focus on the one step back of progress. You know what I mean? Like we take two steps forward and yet there's this one step back and sometimes we can get so worked up about what's not right and what still needs fixed and what isn't working and all that's true. But also take a look around right now. Look around. You may be doing it or not. I don't know. Your faces are kind of in the dark. So maybe you just thought I was rhetorically asking you to look around. But churches like this did not exist 10 years ago, okay? So... Like, the future's bright, and as long as you keep believing in this work and believing in each other and believing in um, the fact that the Spirit is still moving, like, we'll be all right. Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, that's a free sermon. Or we just can be done. Let's go to prayer. <laughs> Maybe we'll end on a high note. Um, all right. So you are in a series called Peace of Mind, Faith and Mental Health. And I've been thinking about this as I've been um, getting ready for today, thinking about my book, The Shift, and the work that I do with those who have left, or you might say being, for some even kicked out of their more conservative evangelical worlds, and, 
and they're moving towards something that still is connected to the heritage of Christianity, but has more of a, a, an open, expansive, progressive flavor to it. And I've been thinking about the, the, the interplay of mental health with that and how, you know, we are a trinity of beings. We are body and we are spirit and we are mind. And so there is no way in which the spirit can move on a spiritual journey that doesn't impact the mind. These things are are, are, are all interconnected and intertwined. And so the journey and the path of spiritual transformation, the, the evolution that we go through, uh, Ryan mentioned the name of our church, Sojourn Grace Collective. Sojourn means like a, a, a short stay. This is what the spiritual life is. We're constantly moving and growing and evolving and changing and adapting. And that will absolutely have an impact on what's going on up here and what's going on in here and what it feels like in here. So I want to talk just a, li- just a little bit today about, for me, when I think about the, the path of spiritual growth, when I think about shifting our spiritual perspectives, what I've found is there are two, two significant obstacles that can come up when it comes to this internal battle that we face. Because as I talk about in the book, some of the obstacles when we go through the shift are theological. What do I do? What, how do I think about God anymore? What? What do I do with Jesus? What do I do with the Bible? Uh, church, I can't. How many emails do I get that say this? I can't stand church. Do you know one in my city that I could try? <laughs> you know, like we have this love-hate relationship with this thing. And and, and yet some of the obstacles when we go through this kind of shift, they're, they're the, the, the internal kind. And for me, when I've, when I've done my own shifting, when I've ministered and, and counseled and walked with those who have shifted, like there are two things that have stood out to me that have been this sort of roadblock to this, uh, this, this, this burst of transformation. And for me, these two things are fear and shame, fear and shame. Um, I'd say about eight years ago, I began my journey of regular therapy. Um, Whether it's worked or not, I don't know (laughs) Uh, what it does even mean to work. But I I have been in and out of of therapy on and off for eight years. And I remember shortly into my time with Allison, there was one afternoon where I was sitting on her baby blue love seat. And she was in her chair across from me. And I was... I don't know if you've ever been to therapy or sort of had a couch to sit on, but for me, I've found like when I'm feeling light and open and spacious, I generally sit like in the middle of the couch. I notice sometimes though, if I come in and I sit like on the very edge of the couch, that's my body's way of saying I'm like trapped, like <laughs> like a cage, like to, oof, I don't know that I want to be here. And this particular afternoon, I was noticing how far tucked into the corner I was. And I had my, when I tend to sit, I tend to cross my legs, like, especially if I'm nervous or anxious. Uh, and I do this thing where I'll sort of rub my ear and I'm like, oh, that's my body's way of saying I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding something. I'm anxious. I'm uncomfortable. And so even though Allison's sitting there patiently awaiting, cause she just asked me a question and I'm sitting here trying to avoid answering the question. And there's this lavender, uh, uh, uh candle like burning in the corner of the room. That's supposed to soothe you or whatever. And I'm just sitting there. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm just hoping that Allison will start talking again because the awkward silence, I thought I could wait in awkward silence, but I I stood no chance against this therapist trained in emotionally focused therapy. (laughs) She's like, she asked me a question and then she wasn't going to do anything until I responded. So I'm sitting there rubbing my ear, crossing my legs, like not wanting to respond to the question. And her question was this. She wanted to know what it was like for me to be in her office week after week trying to get in touch with the the emotional part of myself that had been largely, I'd been disconnected to for most of my life. And I had been trying to become a certain kind of person for the relationships in my life, for the work, for my own self. I was trying to become a particular kind of person. And I said to her, finally, after waiting, and she wasn't going to budge, 
And she said, what's that like for you to, to come here week after week and try um, and talk about this? And I finally said, I, I just don't think I can do it, Allison. I don't think I can become the kind of person that I think I need to become. I don't think I can do it. And she said, Colby, can I reframe that for you? I said, Allison, if I say no, will you not? <laughs> can I reframe that for you? What if, what if instead of you can't do it, what if what's really true is that you're afraid to do it? And I don't know what you're like, but for me, when I hear something that is like capital T true, it has a way of just like just lands right here and my body has a way of saying, okay, that's true. <laughs> uh, it's not that I can't do it. What if, what if I'm afraid to do it? What if I'm afraid to make these changes in my life? What if I'm afraid to try and, and approach things differently? What if I'm afraid to be someone other than I've always been? And I was thinking more about that, and I realized I, uh, if you can't do something, then that lets you off the hook for when you fail. You know what I mean? Like, I could try as hard as I want to be an NBA player, but at the end of the day, I'm just like, look, I, I can't do it. Like, I'm not tall enough, I'm not fast enough, I'm too old. I can't do it. And I can go to bed at night not really feeling all that bad about myself. I'm like, I can't, it's just too hard. But if it's just a matter of being afraid of something, like, that kind of starts and stops with me. Like, now I've got some responsibility. Now it's actually a thing I could maybe do. It's just the fear that's holding me back. Just a fear that's holding me back. Let me go back to Jacob and Esau for a second. So this story of Jacob wrestling late at night with this unnamed person. Most of the time, I think if you've heard this story or read this story or, or read the, the heading in your Bibles, it, might, it probably says Jacob wrestles with God or someone else said an angel, right? These are kind of the two common interpretive moves. And I'm not here to tell you that that's wrong. What do I know? Um, I'm here to tell you that for me, a number of years ago, when I read this story, it mapped onto my life in such an overwhelmingly uh, synchronistic way that I saw this story for me in a whole new light, and I've never been able to unsee it. And here, by the way, fun fact, like this is sort of how the Jewish scriptures, how the, the, the Hebrew people have always approached things like this, which is, of course, there are multiple ways to understand a story, of course. Did Jacob wrestle with God? Yes. Did Jacob wrestle with an angel? Uh-huh. Did Jacob wrestle with what I'm about to tell you? Of course. All of it. So for me, I go back to the details of this story. And I think when I, when I, when I read this story, when I think about it, when I think about my own life, for me, that night when Jacob was all alone, stripped of everything that he had, anxious about confronting this thing that he'd been avoiding for 20 years, I think, for me, Jacob wrestled with a past version of himself. I think Jacob was wrestling himself that evening. I mean, think about it. Evenly matched, wrestled all night long. Nobody could get the advantage. Um, when Jacob asks the unnamed visitor, like, what's your name? And, and, and the unnamed visitor responds with, why do you ask me my name? Why do you ask? Almost as if to say, you, you know who I am. Why are you asking me my name? And in that moment where the, the, the unnamed visitor says, like, you're, you're no longer Jacob, you are Israel. And Israel is roughly translated as God shall fight. I read this story, and what I see is I see a man who has spent 20 years running from taking responsibility for his life, um, he, he has this whole plan where he's devised a way to try and pacify his brother, to try and get out, to try and squirrel out of taking responsibility. And when I said I can relate to that, here's what I mean. Up until somewhat recently in my life, I was really, really good at pacifying people and trying to squirrel my way out of taking responsibility for things. So when I read Jacob's plan of like, if I do this and I do that nice thing and I do this good thing, then I won't have to ever say, I'm sorry. 
Let me just do extra dishes. <laughs> um, let me just surprise you with an Amazon gift. And that way I won't ever have to take responsibility. So I get Jacob. Like, that, that lives in me. That sort of conniving, manipulative uh, massaging of the truth as a way to avoid ever admitting that I did something wrong. Ugh. I know that move well. I think Jacob is wrestling not with God, although obviously wrestling with God. I think this is a this might be a story where Jacob's wrestling with himself because he's in this he's in this liminal space, this transitional moment where he could continue to be Jacob. He could. And I bet you've been in those moments before where you've, had, where you've been stripped of everything, where you've had someone leave you, or you've been kicked out of a particular community, or you've lost all your possessions, or, 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 or you've been diagnosed with this sickness, or you've lost a loved one, whatever it is, and you get to this point where you're like, I, I feel as though this is an invitation for me to consider going a different way with my life. And sometimes we don't take that invitation. Sometimes we just keep going ahead because what we know is what we know. And there's this other beautiful story, I'm not going to get into it, where Jesus is on the lake with his disciples and there's a storm and the disciples are freaking out. You remember this story? The disciples are freaking out and they wake up Jesus and they're like, what? do something, help. And Jesus calms the storm. And once the storm is calm, then he turns to his friends and he says, why are you so afraid? Isn't that interesting that he says, why are you so afraid after the storm has been calmed? Not in the midst of the storm. And sometimes I think it's because the storm we actually get comfortable with. It's the calm on the other side of the storm that can terrify us because at least in the storm like even if we're suffering we're somewhat familiar with okay I know what this feels like I'm really good at being a victim woe is me this is scary but the healing on the other side oh, that's real scary anyway where was I man are you getting all these bonus sermons this is fantastic okay so so you get you have these moments where you can maybe keep going as Jacob, or you, you, sometimes the divine shows up. This is why I say, of, co of course he was wrestling God too, obviously. Sometimes the divine shows up in a way that, that opens up this alternative pathway where if we choose it, if we choose to go down this, we will experience a kind of growth, transformation, but it is real scary. It is real scary. What I love about how this story ends is when you turn the page to chapter 33. If you recall, in the previous chapter, Jacob had this plan of trying to pacify his brother, trying to ensure that by the time he got there, at the very last one to arrive, that his you know, anger had come down, he was ready to, to reconcile. But chapter 33, Jacob instead kind of situates his family in the groups, and then it says Jacob actually went to the front of the, of the line. And as he approached his brother Esau, it says Jacob humbled himself and bowed seven times to the ground. A very different response, is it not? From the guy who's used to conniving and manipulating and swindling and trying to figure out how to massage the situation so as to never have to take this posture. And as a result, Esau comes running and th throws himself around his brother and kisses him, and there's this beautiful reconciliation moment. What happened in this story? Why? What's going on? Remember when... There was this name change moment. Like in, in the scriptures, there's a lot of these name change moments, and, and they're, they're significant. Like we should pay attention when there are these name change moments. And the unnamed visitor, who I'm referring to as Jacob's old self, Jacob 1.0, says to now Jacob 2.0, your name's not Jacob anymore, it's Israel. This is your new name. This is who you are now. And Israel, as I said, roughly translated means God shall fight. God shall fight is very, Israel is very different from Jacob. 
Jacob is, I'm going to control the situation. I'm going to ensure that the outcome is as I want it to be. I'm going to be the one that's, that's, that has all the power here. I'm going to be the one to, to make all the decisions and the choices. It's me, like, that is Jacob. That is Jacob. Israel is God, uh, God shall fight. Israel is, and I'm playing with a phrase here that I'm hoping will catch on, but I don't know if it'll have lasting power. Israel is let go and let God. <laughs> Forget it. When we see in Genesis 33 the next morning, when we see Jacob, now known as Israel, come to the front of the line and humble himself before his brother seven times and accept this responsibility and put himself in this posture of, I have wronged you and I'm sorry, this is a letting go of all of the defense mechanisms that we've ever used to shield ourselves from taking responsibility. This is us letting go of the fear that we can't ever be another person because it's not about can't be, it's about being afraid to be. This is the letting go. Israel is the letting go of that. If you're in this room or watching us online, I'm assuming that you know a bit of what it's like to go through these journeys, these shifts in your theology, in your relationships, in your spiritual practices. I'm assuming that if you're here, then you know what it's like to have at times been alone on the side of a river, wondering, where do I go from here? And if that's you, then I'm assuming that you also know the anguish that can come online when you feel like you're on the precipice of these shifts, at the precipice of these transformations, and yet suddenly what comes online, what, what, what overwhelms you maybe one night in, the, in a Tuesday in the middle of November is this old version of yourself that says, hey, 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 what are you doing? We've worked really hard to get you here. We've put in a lot of time in Bible study. We've attended way too many sermons. We've donated tithes and offerings to churches A, B, and C. Your family raised you a certain kind of way. What do you, where do you think you're going? And this is what I think sometimes happens in these journeys that we go on in our, in our faith, in our, in our life, is we, we, we start to experience growth and transformation, and then suddenly our old selves show up and say, not so fast. Where are you going? And we have this, this internal struggle between the curiosity of our new self that like feels, I think there's something beyond. And our old self that says, no, stay back here where it's warm and cozy and safe. And you've got a small group that likes you. And you've got programs for your kids. And you know all the Bible verses. And you can answer, like, just stay here. It's cozy. It's nice. It's safe. I know that struggle real, real well. And I'm guessing some of you know it as well. It's scary to... to consider changing beliefs. It's scary to try new churches. It's scary to try not going to church for a while. Because there's a part of you that invested a lot of time and energy and resources and intention into getting where you're at. So yeah, of course it's gonna be hard. Of course, that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. That doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. Hey, th life is hard. Hmm? The spiritual life is hard. Uh-huh. Changing and growing and transforming is, if it wasn't hard, if, you, if there wasn't these late night wrestling matches with old versions of ourselves, then you're probably not actually experiencing growth.
Jacob was one who ran away from responsibility. Jacob was one who connived others to get what he wanted. Jacob was one who didn't know how to confront his own sense of self. But Israel, Israel is an opening. Israel is a letting go. And when I go back to the story, and this is kind of the, the point I've been circling and what I want to leave with you. When I go back to the story, there's this moment, there's this interaction between Jacob 1.0 and Israel, Jacob 2.0. There's this moment where as the sun is rising up over the hills where this the stranger in the night, the divine, the old version of Jacob says, let me go. Notice how when we change the tone a bit, it changes how it lands as a story. One is, let me go. The other is, let me go. It's okay. It's daybreak. It's a new day. You're not Jacob anymore. You're Israel. It's okay. And so I often think, when we go through these shifts and these moments where we begin to experience transformation and growth and it's scary and it's exciting all at the same time and we have these old versions of ourselves that then try to reach out and grab us and pull us back where it's safe and comfortable, I oftentimes think that we can, we can think that it's the old self and, and it won't let us go, it won't let us go, like, come on, let me grow. And what if it's really our current selves afraid to keep going and so we hold on to past versions of ourselves. And maybe today we can hear some of the past versions of ourselves say, hey, hey, it's okay. You can let me go. You can let me go. I know I'm the version of you that had all these beliefs figured out. I know I'm the version of you that had an answer for things. I know I'm the version of you that had a, a, a community and a family that, that where, where things made sense for a while, but guess what? That's not, that's not you anymore. And it's okay. You can, you can go on without me. It's okay. Some of you know that I um, used to work at a church here in town um, like 15 years ago. And if you've read my first book on Clobber, I tell a bit of the story about how ultimately I was fired from that church when they um, learned that my theology was inclusive of LGBTQ folk. And yesterday I was uh, on my way to the, the lovely Gear household and I saw the exit off the freeway that, that takes me to my old church. I'm like, I'm going to go there. And I did. <laughs> and I pulled into the driveway and, and the parking lot and drove around. And I'm not entirely sure what compelled me to do that. I think just curiosity, maybe. But I think subconsciously, I wanted to know what's it going to feel like to walk these pavers that I was a part of helping put in the ground? What's it going to feel like? And this is part of Colby 2.0, let's be honest, 12.0. I don't know what version I'm on now. But part of Colby 12.0 is this constant getting outside of my current experience and getting curious about what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. I'm trying to be aware of it. And so I'm like, I want to know as I walk this place, what's it, what's it going to feel like? And I parked the, the van um, that I, the rental van that I've been driving and I start walking the courtyard and I take a, little, take a little selfie of me in front of the building and I go inside one of the buildings because there's an activity going on in there and I kind of just poking around and, and all these memories come flooding back of, of, uh, of being in the, in the office with my coworkers and, and the, the games we would play and the things we would dream about. And I walk across to another building that wasn't there when I was there because we had just started dreaming about what it would be like to build it right before 
I left and I walk into that building and they had some other event going on and and I even ran into an old colleague there and uh, greeted him with a big warm hug and we chatted for a while and, and he said man I hope it's okay if I ask you but how is it for you being here right now? And I took a pause and I did that thing where I check in with myself and I said, it's really good. I got nothing but gratitude in my heart right now. And as the words came out of my mouth, I'm like, that's interesting. joy, peace. And it was almost as though, to go back to the story, it was almost as though this old version of me that might have years ago harbored some resentment, harbored some bitterness, harbored some anger at what happened there. It was almost as though that part of me was like, Hey, bud, let me go. I don't think I'm serving you anymore. It's okay. You're okay. Let me go. And even more than that, it was as though my old self was like, can you see how what happened to you back then or what happened back then where like, everybody was doing the best that they could with what they had? They were trying to live out their convictions with integrity in the same way that you were. So let me go. You're okay. And so beloved here of the well, I think what I want to ask you this morning is, are there past versions of yourself as you have been experiencing these shifts in your faith over the last year, two years, five years, ten years? Are there past versions of yourself that you've been afraid to let go of? Whereas you might think they won't let go of you, and you're like, man, when am I ever going to stop feeling this? What if, it's, what if it's ultimately your choice to let go of those past versions of yourself? To to drop the fear of who you might be now, even though it's so different from who you used to be. What is it this morning or this week, or I don't know, as the year goes on? Are there particular relationships that have ended? Uh, Family members that you're estranged from? And it's not so much that I'm saying let go of the relationship, although maybe that's the move for a while. But maybe it's a let go of the clinging to try to control and try to hold on to what has been lost already. Maybe it's the, that's just not what we have anymore. And that's scary. But clinging on to it isn't going to do me any good either. Are there beliefs that as you have been shifting and growing and changing, that you realize, I don't know that I can really hold on to this anymore with integrity. It doesn't really line up with the world as I understand it. It doesn't line up with the people that I'm in community with. It just doesn't really make sense to me anymore. But it can be really scary to set down these beliefs that we've cherished for so long. But what if today, what if the invitation is even hearing that old version of yourself that clung to those beliefs so tightly, no, I have to believe this thing. I have to. What if that version of yourself this morning is saying, hey, let me go. It's okay. It's okay. I guess for me and... and Part of why I'm out doing this thing, talking with communities, meeting people, and doing this work is because I don't think things like fear or shame, 
I do not believe these are intended to be a part of a life that is flourishing, wholehearted, abundant. And if anything, friends, if anything in your life looks like that, fear and shame, maybe it's just just practice letting that go. Letting that go. And you might say, that sounds really, you're making it sound so easy. It kind of is. It kind of is as easy as just letting it go. But I get it. 20 minutes later, it's going to come back online. Let it go again. That's the practice. A week later, you'll get triggered by something, and you'll go right back to fighting and and let that go again. This is the practice. I'm going to close in a a prayer slash meditation with you. So if you want, I invite you to close your eyes. You don't have to, um, but I do it just because it helps me to be centered and be grounded and eliminate distraction. And maybe you would take your, your hand, your right or your left hand, whatever you want, and place it, place it on the part of your body where you are most connected with a reminder that you are alive. Uh, it could be your heart where you feel the beat could be your wrist where you feel a pulse. For me, it's right in my gut, right in my torso, right in my abdomen here, my diaphragm, where I experience my breath. And place your hand there. Remind yourself that you are here. You are alive. You're okay. And take a deep breath in with me. And let it out. And on your next breath, I want you to breathe in. Think about a past version of yourself. For me, this could look like the 17-year-old version of myself that was way (laughs) oversaved. Just had to spin every conversation into some sort of test of eternal damnation and thought my job was to save everybody's soul by getting them to pray some magical prayer. So think about some past version of yourself, maybe as it relates to your religious self or whatever. And and as you breathe in, just imagine sort of breathing that version of yourself all the way into your body. Deep breath in. And then on the exhale, can you picture just a thankful letting go of that version of yourself? where you see that not with disgust or embarrassment, because how often is that the case, friends? How often do we think back to previous versions of ourselves and we cringe, like, oh, how could I have thought that? Or how could I have treated people like that? Or how could I have been that? (sighs) Kindness, kindness, be kind, be kind to yourself. And we can let those past versions of ourselves go. They may not be serving us anymore. I know it's scary to imagine being a new version of yourself, but that new version of yourself, that is Israel. That is God shall, God shall handle it. Like your job is to just be open and trust and let go. Let's take in one more deep breath together. And out. God, I pray for my friends here in Arizona, here at the well, and those here who are visiting. I pray for them in the coming days, in the coming weeks, in the months, in the years, as they continue on this journey of faith, trying to imagine and explore and be curious about what it looks like to be a Christian, if that's a title they still want or not, if they no longer have use for it. But as we go, We're going to continually be confronted with this internal struggle between these past versions of ourself. And my prayer is that we would, as many times as those come online and we get afraid and we start to feel shame and we start to feel embarrassed and we start to feel like, what am I doing? Have I so lost the plot? May we always come back to this trust that love never fails 
and that love casts out fear. And every time that happens, may we breathe in and breathe out and let it go. Let me go. It's okay. You're okay. You'll be okay. And the loved sons, daughters, and children of God said, Amen. Thanks.